Where do old aeroplanes go when the time comes to retire them from the sky? Almost one in ten of them are flown to eCube Solutions in Wales, one of the world's fastest growing facilities for the recycling and stripping out of old aircraft. Whatever the customer wants, we'll take off. Every year, around 60 commercial airliners land at the company's designated airbase, and the lads just can't wait to get their hands on them. All these planes, and you just get to play with the biggest toy set in the world. This squadron of high-vis heroes love to get their hands dirty and fly in the face of whatever problems are thrown at them. Yeah, there's pressure. Um, we cope with it, we thrive on it. They join forces to take these old airliners to pieces so their thousands of mechanical components can be sold on to satisfy the growing global demand for refurbished plane parts. Let's get them off the aircraft. But it's a race against the clock to take these multi-million pound planes to pieces before they reach their final destination, the scrapyard. All these are ready to go now, so we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in and they're going to start smashing them up. Join the lads as they battle hostile weather and get to grips with massive machinery. I've seen them go down smoother, put it that way. All to meet deadlines set by bullish buyers. Money's time, time's money. And we're not talking peanuts here, we're talking millions. Welcome to the world of the plane reclaimers. So, good job, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> Future looks bright for our lads in South Wales. Lovely, isn't it? Cracking. <laughs> well, you wouldn't have believed it'd be like this, though, what I thought it was like this morning. It seems that even Perry on his scissor lift is in celebratory mood here on St Athens Air Base today. And for good reason. The lads are notorious for operating like a well-oiled monster machine, relentless in their desire to crush every challenge and devour every demand for the many commercial airliners that end their life in the skies here. Since starting the business of stripping, scrapping and packing recycled aircraft parts just seven years ago, our top team have seen their plane reclamation trade skyrocket, and it's set to get even bigger and better. When it's like this, lad, everything's good, we're all happy, and the place is a better place when the sun's out. Even though the pan's a mess, when the sun's out, it's more glorious. <laughs> <laughs> Later, E-Cube will see the start of an exciting international venture. But right now, there's an aircraft inbound. It's due to touch down any minute, and Perry is well up for this one. Got an Airbus coming into land in the next five minutes. Uh, that will be our 125th plane that we've got to work on. So that'll be some kind of achievement. Cruising at more than 30,000 feet above France is an Airbus A319. This narrow-bodied, twin-engine commercial airliner is making its last ever voyage. 750 nautical miles from Zurich to Cardiff. Martin is the co-pilot for this final farewell flight, and he's full of pride at this special moment. For us, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an honor that we get to do that. Uh, we know that this aircraft has served for almost 30 years. Uh, without any, any major incidents. This aircraft is not uh, competitive anymore from an economical point of view compared to the new aircraft that they are more efficient, more fuel efficient. So at the end, it's just the, the logical decision. The only souvenirs we have are the memories to, to fly with this aircraft. And for Martin, that final memory will be the A319's last landing. Descending from the east, the Airbus glides over farmers' fields and into St. Athens airspace. 15, 40, 30, 20. The runway here is 2,000 feet shorter than many commercial airports, and some planes find it much harder to slow down and make the turn onto the taxiway. But this nimble, narrow-bodied Airbus makes it seem effortless to the eyes of the ground crew. And waiting with open arms to meet the aircraft is Head of Operational Support Bob Hayden 
and young technician Mac Bridges. We'll um, get everything in position over on the engine running pan, um, drag the steps over with the tug. I think as soon as it will be doing um, some engine work to it. Martin has been to St Athen before, but E-Cube's size and scale has increased greatly since he last landed. I was here last year, exactly one year ago, um, and I'm surprised by the, the amount of aircraft that are around. I remember last time we had, I saw maybe three aircraft, and now it's, it's amazing. The increasing number of aircraft that are now ending their working lives here is certainly keeping the lads busy. And with this A319, it's fallen to Bob to administer the last rites and switch off its power for the final time. Oh, we'll just shut the APU down now and get the aircraft ready to tow away. There she goes. There is a bit of an eerie feeling when you turn the um, APU and off and power goes off, because everything goes quiet, because even when there's nothing operating, there's always a buzz. You can hear things buzzing and moving. That's it, done. Yeah. The Swiss airline who operates the aircraft are using E-Cube to strip out its engines and reuse them within their own fleet of aircraft. Nils Couch works as a technician for the Swiss airline. He's staying in Wales for a couple of days to oversee the safe removal of the A319's engines and to make sure they get swiftly transported back to Zurich so they can go straight back onto the wing of another aircraft. I am overseeing the engine removal done by the colleagues from EQ and just make sure that everything is followed to the procedures. And with the other Swiss plane grounded and not earning the airline money until its new engine is fitted, time is of the essence. So we have right now is a time schedule of two days to remove the engine over here, pack it, put it on a truck and send it back over to Zurich, do all the required inspections over there and get it installed on another A319 in about 10 days' time. Nils, the Swiss engine technician, is expecting a very speedy turnaround. And working to meet this urgent order will be two of E-Cube's youngest technicians, Mac and Khalil, who will be working under Nils' direct supervision. Will these two young lads measure up to the task? Before we find out, there's some other pressing work to be done. With the earlier arrival of the A319 from Switzerland, Khalil has already got his hands dirty. But Mac's been tasked with another high priority. Right now, he's not rising to meet the challenge of removing a valuable aileron or elevator from the aeroplane. Mac has national pride at stake, as he's taking the cherry picker to sort out the ever-increasing number of flags of the world that hang from the rafters. Watching the ritual from below is managing director Tim Schmidt. For every aircraft that we do, a project, we'd uh, buy a flag and we put it up on the, on the ceiling. You see all the different places they come from, Australia, and you have uh, the Philippines, uh, China, good old USA, um, and then obviously a lot of Europeans. But it's amazing that a relatively small business in Wales, and yet we have aircraft from all over the world coming here. So it's moved on from seven or eight in the first year to what's gonna be about 30 or 40 this year so yeah as well as a swiss flag that now needs to be strung up there have been two other recent arrivals and they've made their final flights from cardiff airport so as a proud welshman mac has the honor of flying the flag for his home nation it would be good for the welsh boys to have a welsh flagger then we've got, we've got a dragon on the front of a flag who wouldn't want a dragon better than a, a boring cross isn't it it's the welsh flag a mighty dragon. I'm happy with that. Don't make, don't make. And Mac's not the only one, as the new addition is going down well with most of the lads down below. Well, the local ones, anyway. It's an honor for him to be able to go up and put those flags, although he doesn't seem to do the American flags very well, as you'll see. He, all of them look really nice and straight until I get to Old Glory, and they're messed up on a couple of these, so um, he's gonna have to sort those out. The American flag is not very good there. It's all wonky. All right, all right, I'll do it. Thank you. And Mac, if you want to get ahead in the plane reclamation trade, it's probably advisable to stay on the right side of your American boss. 
But to make matters worse, by the time Mac gets back up there to work on his promotion, the wind has blown one of the American flags cockeyed up over the beams. This is probably going to be the best looking out of, uh, out of all of them, just because of the circumstances. Try and make at least one go right. There he is, look, down there. <laughs> Now that old glory's flying high, it's time for Mac to make his boss really happy and get busy with some real work, removing the A319's turbofan engines. The Airbus A319 that landed earlier is now parked up and being prepped in the hangar. Some 1,140 items will be removed in total, and the very top priority are its engines, which need to be inspected for damage before they can be removed. We're here today to carry out a body scrub inspection of the internal um, components of the, of the engine to see its current condition. We're using a camera on the end of a flexible um, probe so we can get in to the engine internally, we've got the ability to measure the damage with the recording to see whether they are serviceable or whether any damage has occurred since its last operations. If there are signs of any major damage, it could spell disaster for the lads and render their $6 million engine all but worthless to Nils, the Swiss engine project leader, who needs it to go back into service on another plane as soon as possible. But it looks like bad news. Well, I've found a little bit of damage, just a little nick in the blade. So I just want to measure it. There was probably a little bit of a, a stone which may have passed through the engine, picked up a little nick on the leading edge of the blade. If it's within limits, no effect. If it's out the limit, very bad, because the engine will have to go through a shop then where the engine actually gets physically pulled apart to get access to that blade. But it's very, very expensive. It's a tense wait whilst Brian compares his findings with the engine's safety guidelines. If the blade is so badly damaged that it needs a repair, then that will cost the lads time and money that they just can't afford. Brian has reached his conclusion. It's well within limit. So just want to make sure that, um, I guess, just glancing at it, uh, that it probably was within limits, but now I've got the evidence to prove that it is within limit. It's reassuring news. With the all clear, under supervision, Mac and Khalil can now start disconnecting the engine from the wing. Capable of producing a thrust powerful enough to propel an Airbus A319 150 knots down a runway, it's pretty swift. But right now, Mac and Khalil are having to work at a snail's pace. Under supervision, they're attempting to slide the engine and its intakes carefully onto the support cradle. Unusually for an engine removal, the Swiss Airlines has demanded that the side intakes stay connected to the engine. It's going to make Mac and Khalil's day significantly more challenging. Basically, there's, there's just enough room. Mike, there's enough room on our side, but not this side, so you don't have to switch all of it. Yeah. Knowing how much is at stake, Khalil doesn't look confident. Stop, 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 stop. It needs to come my side, yeah. Back a little bit. This is my third or fourth one, uh, completely on my own now. Um, I'm just getting more used to what you've got to look out for uh, in terms of you know, damages and stuff. It is a bit scary, especially when you're close underneath to, um, to the pipes and the drain masts underneath. Um, it can be a bit daunting. Mac needs to guide Khalil slowly into position. Stop, 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 stop. But they also need to react quickly enough to avoid any damage. There is no room for error. Sliding the engine onto the cradle without damaging it is coming down to a matter of millimetres. I stop. I'm pretty much there. I'm there. It was a close call, but they've pulled it off. So exactly how much damage could Khalil have done to the engine? A couple of hundred thousand, probably. Or maybe into the millions. <laughs> it's clear that any damage would have been extremely costly for the Swiss airline. But when it comes to refurbished plane parts, not everything is as expensive as it first seems.
It's full steam ahead for the takeout and teardown of the Swiss A319, with more than 1,140 valuable parts needing to be pulled left, right and centre. And it's a busy day for Andrew Keegan, as he's received an intriguing phone call from someone interested in picking up a part. I just got off the phone with a new customer who's got um, a private jet, and they're looking to have something a lot bigger on site. So I've set up a meeting with him for next week for him to come down and have a look at what we've got and what we can offer him. But his ideas are pretty intriguing, so it'll be a, a good visit, I think. E-Cube's latest client lives 90 miles along the south coast of Wales in the town of Tenby, where he's very proud to show off his existing collection of flashy aircraft. My name is Toby Rhys Davis. This is my Lockheed Jetstar. It may be pushing nearly 50 years old, but nothing says opulence more than having a luxury private jet parked up in your backyard. So you can see you've got the original door here. Uh, still working. This would have been the bar and kitchen area for the stewardess. And then going through to what would have been the original bathroom. It's like something out of Dallas, isn't it? Gold finish. The copious amount of bling is not all the Jetstar can boast about. As befitting an aircraft this showy, it comes with a somewhat checkered history. It was owned by uh, gun runners and traffickers, and they used to fly out to Belize, and, and so it really is sort of, you know, rock and roll in the skies. Rock and roll indeed. But the evil-eyed among you will have already spotted this plane is missing the most vital component for luxury air travel, its wings. That's because Toby has, in fact, transformed this retired private jet into a lavish aeronautical camping experience, which he rents out to holiday makers. We've got virtually a whole cockpit with all the original instrumentation. When kids get here, they literally spend an hour or two in here, and they just pretend that they're flying to countries. So even though they're just staying here in this field, they just their uh, imag imagination runs wild. Fly off into the sunset. That's the idea. But this flightless private jet is not the only unique aeronautical-themed glamping experience that Toby has on offer. He also has a UFO-inspired pod, as well as a few slightly more traditional yurts. Well, traditional if you're a Mongolian. Most people come up with these sort of ideas, um, maybe after a few drinks and wake up the next morning and say, oh, that wasn't such a clever idea. But unfortunately, um, I'm the sort of person who will then get up the next morning and go and do it anyway. But Toby's not quite done with adding to his out-of-this-world collection. So he's off to E-Cube for some inspiration with his partner and campsite manager, Tiffany. We're looking for a kitchen area for uh, our UFO. I'm thinking if we could utilise um, part of the plane, um, it, yeah, it would be very attractive, it'd be very interesting. I don't think many people have done that before. And it's reusing the aircraft, so yeah, that's the idea. Andrew is in charge of drumming up new business, and he deals with all sorts of requests from all sorts of clients. It's not just airlines that are interested in picking up parts, as Andrew regularly deals with everyone from furniture makers to film crews looking for a movie set. No two days are the same, but that's what makes it interesting, and that's why I enjoy it so much. I meet different people every day with all different ideas and different things they want to make out of this stuff, and the more we can sell for that purpose, they can be recycled, the better, because that's what we're here for. Although the E-Cube lads have not stripped and scrapped any alien spacecraft yet, the fuselage from this A319 could be just the thing to add on to Toby's flying saucer to give those visiting little green men some home comforts. Fridge, freezer, mm -hmm. you get it all in there. Yeah. Get on the top. Yeah. Trouble is, there's just one thing missing. It's just the sink. Well, yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Wash the dishes in the shower. <laughs> From the minute they came in, they seemed to have an idea of what they wanted. So they wanted something they could make signage from, which again, we've got some small sections of wing and that we can, we can supply for that purpose. They've looked at other components like the uh, air intakes, but I don't think they realised the, the value of those units before uh, I told them today. So those are a bit of um, on a back burner for the time being. I'm not surprised Toby's passed on it. An air intake in good working order doesn't come cheap, but it could be worth tens of thousands of dollars. Is that the life raft? Uh, yes, <laughs> off the door. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs>
20 grand, it's all yours. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Back to the fuselage now, and it's time to do business. So how much does it work out per metre? It's unusual to sell a section like this on, but for the owner of the aircraft, it will mean a few thousand dollars more than if the fuselage were just going for scrap. So everybody's happy. And all you'd have to do is do the carpet and yeah. put the furniture in, really, yeah. and seal the ends, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that they're very interested in, and I certainly think they're going to be um, progressing with this as long as the uh, shipping side of things doesn't cost them as much as buying the piece in the first place. But it's not just the hefty transport cost that could scupper Toby's dream of a new plane. We might have to take the fence down to get it in, and take the hedge down. Yeah, yeah, this could definitely work. Um, it's a logistic thing of moving. This thing is um, 13 foot wide. My gates are only 14 foot. It's just not. It, it's not going to be simple to, um, it, you know, just trying to mentally think: Can we do it? W is it too much of a challenge? Don't know. Challenge? Did you say? That's music to the ears of our top team of teardown boys. But will Toby and Tiffany be able to overcome their logistical issues to expand their range of unique aeronautical-themed glamping experiences? We'll pop back later to find out. Back in the hangar, and Mac and Khalil are continuing to remove one of the A319's turbofan engines under the watchful eye of Nils from the Swiss airline. But having inched the cradle into position, the lads are faced with another problem. One of the pins that secures the frame just won't fit. So this is this has been bent outwards from its original place. So as we're putting the pins in, it just gets stuck. This is what holds the back of the engine to the stand. So we can't we can't compromise the strength of it. So because of that. It's basically brought everything to a halt. When something is um, is going wrong, you can definitely feel it with the team you're working with. Um, so it can get a bit stressful and anxious um, around your team members, but you've just got to keep your head up and try and figure out the best solutions as quick as possible. Matt calls in Nick Baldwin, EQ's head of technical, to see if he can come up with a solution. That's never going to put the smiles off, man. Eh? Using all his experience and a little brute force, Nick manages to drive the pin back in so they can carry on lowering the engine. So right now what's happening is uh, that actually that's a very critical part. That's where the engine physically gets detached from the pylon. You know, Mac, keep an eye on your pin, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, how far on you, side? Bro, my thing's uh, stuck. Take it up again. You are stuck. My pin is stuck. The engine is fixed to the cradle with large metal pins, but getting them into the right place at the right time can be very tricky. It's in bent at the moment, that's the problem. It's in bent at the moment. <laughs> now this thing's jammed in, bro. How's it got jammed in? It's catch on the bottom. On the bottom? Yeah, it's not completely up yet on this side either. Mac has had a brainwave. I like, we have to lift the leg up. Huh? Have to lift the leg up. Legs up, engine's higher, which means we can lift this higher. Good idea. The cradle is um, catching on the stand, so we need to get the cradle a bit higher. So we're going to pump this, get the engine a little higher off the ground. Max's plan is to pump up the aircraft's suspension to raise the cradle. If it works, it'll give the lads a few valuable extra centimetres to help manoeuvre the engine. It's an ingenious idea, but what does Nils, the Swiss engineer supervising the lads, make of it all? The impression I have from, from the E-cube over here is actually it's a very professional handle. It's always a straightforward plan on what we do next and how we tackle things to get it done right for all the parties involved. It's reassuring to know that Nils is happy. After all, he's here to protect the Swiss Airlines' expensive asset and to transfer it onto Zurich, where it will be checked over before being put back onto another plane. There you go. Success. Thanks to Mac's master plan, it looks like they pulled it off. With some precision adjustments to the two and a half ton engine, they can start getting the pins into place. A quarter, ready? Yeah. Click by careful click, they raise the engine into position. 
I need to go up a little more, man. A little more. Okay, one more click. And they've done it. The pin is finally in. Up to now, it's pretty good, yes. They're on a good track. Taking the last bolts out, and then we will drop the engine with the cradle into the stand. Once they've lowered the engine, it will be moved out of the hangar. We are right. Go on. Finally, yeah. they can inch the engine slowly away from the wing. Yeah. Go on, it's going back, bro. Considering the trouble the lads have had with this one, they've completed their mission in excellent time. When I came in this morning, I spoke to Mac. I said, our target is this should be done by lunchtime. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so even though it's a little later, um, we haven't gone for lunch yet as well, so... Late lunch isn't too bad. I mean, uh, we can still make the end of lunch, so technically, they come off in time. Whilst the lads grab a quick breather and bite to eat, there's been no such let-up for the engine. It's been whisked off to get packed and wrapped before it's stacked onto a transporter, ready for its 700-mile road trip back to Zurich. So now it's gone in a truck back home, waiting for another aircraft to be installed in. We're going now uh, over the channel back to Zurich and hopefully be there on Monday. Today is Thursday and it's scheduled to be installed on Thursday again. So it's one week from now where we have to have this engine back in zero. For this engine to get a new lease of life, it needs to be back in Switzerland and onto the wing of another plane in just seven days. We'll see how it's getting on later. But it's not the only thing making an epic voyage. The next aircraft due in for the lads to get their greasy mitts on is an Airbus A320, which was previously owned by a now defunct airline. Such is the cutthroat world of the aviation industry that only the strongest survive in the face of fierce competition and spiraling fuel prices. While that may be bad for the airline operators, it's great news for the companies that strip out and scrap them. And the next flight due in from Lourdes in France will be somewhat of a milestone for eCube. The aircraft is in excess of 20 years old and one of the first 320s produced. And it's now flown for many years and it comes to the end of its useful life. Since the now defunct airline who owned the aircraft went into receivership, the A320's been out of service and parked up without being flown. So starting its engines might not be as easy as the pilot hoped. OK, starting. Number two. Thank you. FedEx power pressure's there. Two. It's not a good start for the engine, and it's refusing to turn over. Engine master two, off. OK, we have a start fault engine number two. With more than 40 years of experience in the air, Captain Hannon knows just the thing to get this Airbus going. What we're going to do is we're going to try a second start on that engine, all right? So, engine two coming in again. See, it's cranking away, but there's no fuel going into it yet. OK, started normally that time. We're going to have a go at number one now. It was just a minor issue with the start on one of the engines. The automatic restart just hiccuped slightly, so we made a manual intervention. And just to know it's a routine thing, it happens occasionally. OK, this time they Success. all Success! It's finally time to take to the skies. See you on the left-hand side. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Unusually for a plane that's reached the end of its working life, this A320 isn't destined to be stripped and scrapped in Cardiff. It set its sights on a much hotter climate, 320 miles away in Castellón, Spain. Yes, that's right. To meet the growing global demand for valuable second-hand aircraft parts and knock-down prices, the lads from Wales are expanding, and they're taking their plane reclamation trade to Spain. Ready to go. EQ Espanol. <laughs> Having just about reached aircraft capacity at St. Athen, E-Cube need to open a second site. Fresh off a flight from the UK, Tim Schmidt and Mac Bridges are driving to the new base to welcome in the company's very first Spanish arrival. Currently, we have uh, nothing really set up at, at uh, the airport. Of course, Mac knows how to put the aircraft into uh, a uh, temporary parking situation. So um, 
We still have a lot to go by the end of the month where we put a logging in bay and get the tech team and the logistics team in place. There's still plenty to do to get this Spanish operation up to full speed. But like everything the lads do, the choice of Castellon is a calculated one. A couple of years ago, we were starting to look at different um, opportunities in Europe, and Spain was the choice of most leasing companies and, and aircraft uh, owners as a place to want to, to park your aircraft for anywhere medium to long term because of the climate. It's mainly the, the dryness that, that attracts it for aircraft parking. There's less deterioration, um, corrosion, and corrosive uh, elements. Currently, we can handle about 20 aircraft, and we want to make it so you can handle any, anywhere up to uh, 50 aircraft. And the very first of these final flights is inbound now. We're just about uh, 60 miles from Barcelona, heading south. Uh, we're at 33,000 feet. We have a speed across the ground at the moment of about 540 miles an hour. The aircraft, despite the fact that it's old and being scrapped, is operating perfectly. Everything is working normally, even though it's on its way to the scrapyard. Whilst E-Cube get fully up to speed in their new base, the Airbus A320 will be stored for a few weeks before it's eventually scrapped on site here in Spain. The journey to Castellón to meet the aircraft reminds Tim of a similar trip he made at the very start of E-Cube. So yeah, it was about seven years ago, almost the day, it's uh, in March, that we were doing a similar trip to uh, St. Athen uh, with Mike and I to visit our, well, to welcome our first 737 Classic into uh, into St. Nathan. In fact, it landed a couple days before we had the lease. <laughs> there you go, Mac. Espanol EQ. The lads have arrived at Castellón. With the Airbus A320 from France still inbound, we'll check back with them later to see them greet their first arrival to EQ Spain. over in sunny Wales and there have been some developments in Toby's glamping order. After Toby's visit, he decided to take a few measurements home and, and have a play and see what he can get on the, on the site. So now he's done that, he's given me the order for the rear end of the fuselage he wanted. Toby has ordered a 45-foot long section from another Airbus A319 that's already been stripped of all its serviceable parts. But getting this fuselage back to Tembe is not going to be as straightforward as packing up a family tent. And even that can be a challenge. It's a good track in a car, um, a track with a fuselage on the back of a lorry doing about 40 mile an hour is going to be a very interesting one. It's oversized as well on width, so that's going to be even more interesting. Get on the, uh, the rope at the back. The back's going to start going up now. Before the long and arduous journey can begin, they've got to get the fuselage onto the back of a truck. So it's all hands on deck. Considering the size of the fuselage that Toby has ordered, Andrew has some reservations about the transport lorry. We're a little bit surprised by the truck because we were expecting something a bit more substantial. But um, as long as the driver's happy with it, then uh, we're happy with it. So as long as he gets it down to Tembi in one piece, that's all that matters to me. But Andrew need not worry as Chicken is on hand to take control of this situation. But where are you putting these? You can't sit them on this bit. In this job, Andrew really does see it all. And he's glad that bits of planes can be put to good use after they come to the end of their working lives in the air. Most of the time, we sell this sort of section for a movie set, which gets used hundreds of times, I guess. Uh, they just change the interior up a bit, for, depending on the movie. And then other times, it just goes for furniture. So it is, it's wicked to see it getting used for something completely different. I mean, that can sit in a field forever and never rot. I think it's a great use of the structure and a, a great idea. All the lads need to do now is get the fuselage safely onto the lorry so the cabin can be taken to its new home. Pull it that way. Four inches, three feet. OK, OK, that's it then. Perfect. Happy days. <laughs> and it's on. Everything went brilliantly. The crane driver managed to lift it up and over with no issues. Andrew appears pleased with how the loading went, but Chicken's still not so sure the goods will arrive in Tembi in one piece. It's a bit horrific. I wouldn't want to be taking that down on one way, I tell you that. Concerns aside, the lads have fulfilled their part of the bargain. And with everything as safely loaded as possible, Andrew's looking forward to visiting the finished product in place sometime in the future, when the cabin has been installed alongside the UFO. I've seen 
what they've got there at the moment, and they've got some pretty cool features down there with the Jet Star and uh, the UFO. It'll be interesting because I'm going to go down and have a look at it once it's all finished and, uh, and see how it's ended up because it's only down the road from here. So, yeah, it'll be good to see. If you're happy with just two, it's your load. I'm hoping Toby will do make treats. <laughs> but if he does it for me, he's got to do it for everyone. So we'll see what happens with that. Andrew, I'm sure that when the UFO's new cabin companion is complete, it will make a truly out-of-this-world experience. Over 700 miles away in Zurich, and the engine that Mack and Khalil stripped at speed under supervision from the A319 has already arrived. And just as quickly as it was taken off, Swiss technicians are rapidly engineering it back onto the wing of another aircraft. So today we are on our Hangar 3 in Zurich. We replace engine number one of the A319 over here, and we will replace it with the engine we removed in St. Athens the other week. So time pressure on engine changes is usually quite high since every minute the aircraft is on the ground, we are losing money. They only earn money when the aircraft's on flight. The 1,400-mile round trip that the engine has now been on may seem a colossal amount of trouble to go to. But it makes perfect financial sense to the Swiss airline. That's because it's much more cost-effective to swap out an engine in this way than take a whole plane out of service. But the first important step is done. They will now disconnect uh, the hoist kit and then uh, slide the engine away from the pylon. So up to now, it took us uh, two and a half hours from uh, parking the aircraft in the hangar to dropping the engine into the stand, which is a really good time on the second. We shouldn't aim for records, but it's a pretty good time. <laughs> With the defective engine out of the way, it's now time to wheel in the engine the Welsh lads removed in St. Athen and hope that it goes on without a hitch. What will happen right now is you have several connections from the engine to the pylon, which will be connected within the next uh, hour, two hours, which are hydraulics, fuel, all electrical powers, to have the integration again between the engine and the aircraft. The Swiss team know that the reason they're able to work so fast is because Mack and Khalil didn't remove the air intakes that would have normally been taken off to make their job easier. So the sacrifices that the E-Cube crew made mean that the plane will be back carrying passengers quicker than usual. It went really well today. It's one of the, the fastest engine change, actually, we have done on the 319 or 320 aircraft family. It's uh, six and a half hours later, and uh, the engine change is complete. I get a feeling of satisfaction. It's an achievement. So far, this engine has been on quite some journey. After flying into South Wales, the engine was removed, then driven back to Zurich, and within seven days is ready to take to the sky again and the paying passengers will have no idea what it's taken to get them safely airborne. As the Welsh often say, Mein Buru Herr Nragath Afin, it's raining old ladies with sticks. It seems that from his earlier high, Perry's mood is now matching the local weather. It's not very good, because we're outside. The floor is uh, soaking wet. Uh, and you can't, there's not much you can do outside. We're, we're, we're lucky, we're cutting up the top underneath the crown so it's nice and dry. But poor old Phil stuck outside, he's in the wet. But you've got to do it, Ad. You've got to get it done. It's got to be done. Perry may be on a slight downer, but he isn't easily deterred. Before the Swiss A319 can be moved in for its final scrapping, Perry has to clear what's left of another Airbus due for demolition in the yard. We're going to start removing this trim now. And, uh, and that's it. Don't want to. Don't want to go out. Oh, come on, Perry. Man up. It's just a bit of rain. Well, we have to. We better not mention anything about Mac being in sunny Spain. Otherwise, the morale would really plummet. My socks are wet now. Despite the weather, the lads have managed to shunt another fuselage out of the way and are filling their scissor lift quite quickly. This is the life, but it's all worthwhile when the summer comes. Oh, yeah. True to being a proper Welshman, Perry and his pals have soldiered on and successfully finished up. With the last bits of panelling and overhead lockers rescued, Perry and his gang can escape into the dry hangar. 
The row upon row of other salvaged parts from the aircraft are testimony that, in spite of his grumbling, Perry and his crew have been very busy boys. Right, everything up, yeah, trim's up, yeah. Jobs are good. Whilst Perry and his merry men have braved the atrocious Welsh weather, over in sunny Spain, Tim and Mac have also been working hard on their tans. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? It's um, nice and warm, which is a big change from uh, St. Arthur. Um, so I'm not jealous at all of the boys over there, because I heard it was uh, raining today. Castel Leon is close to sandy beaches and the warm waters of the Mediterranean Sea. So it comes as no surprise there wasn't any shortage of volunteers to be the first out here. E-Cube have been able to set up shop in a small corner of this existing airport, and Tim has arranged for some of E-Cube's Welsh kit to be waiting for them. It's quite exciting for me, especially because I'm going to be one of the first technicians on ground uh, waiting for the aircraft. There are a bit of nerves, especially because we're so far away from home base where uh, we've got the support we need, uh, and with the engine com engines coming off next week, uh, I'll be on my own with two other people. So it is a bit scary, but I'm, I'm confident I'm ready. And yeah, I don't mind the distance away from home. Yeah, it's a nice change. Earlier, an Airbus A320 took off from France, making a 300-mile flight to soon become the first arrival at E-Cube Spain. Having cleared the mountains, it's now starting to make its final descent to what will be its ultimate resting place. As Captain Hannon makes a visual on the runway, down on the ground, anticipation is growing for Mac and Tim. It's a real special day for E-Cube today. Uh, it's almost seven years to when we opened in uh, St. Athen. So, yeah, it's uh, pretty psyched up. It's always exciting to see a plane come in uh, to our company, and it's a, it's a nice experience to see it come in to our first uh, extra European base. 100, 50, 40, 30, 20. First, the Spanish landing. Ah, uh, it's a beautiful sight. All right, we'll have to call the owners. The Eagle has landed. I think it's our 127th aircraft. The first of hopefully many. A list of more than 1,400 valuable components has been drawn up. After being stored for a few weeks until the lads are fully up and running, the plane will be stripped of parts here in Castellón. We'll go up and greet the crew, say hello to the captain, the co-captain, and uh, the rep. I'll welcome them to uh, E-Cube Spain. And then uh, Mac will go on and take care of it, park it up, pin up the landing gear, and make it safe for the night. With the plane making a safe and successful landing, Mac can look forward to getting back to catching some rays. Yeah, the tans uh, come along very slowly. I mean, uh, we've been in the shade a lot of the day in the offices. But um, yeah, I should expect uh, and a, a stupid tan by the end of uh, the two-week period. Careful, Mac. You're just rubbing it in now. With Perry having cleared out the demolition yard, the completely stripped-out Swiss A319 has been brought in to face the resident scrap maestro, Chicken. At EQ, planes are recycled in a variety of ways. An engine is handled with the greatest of care because it can be reused to power another plane. But in Chicken's yard, they squeeze the last value out with massive machines and brutal power. All the expensive uh, components and cuts have been removed from the aircraft, um, and what's left by the time the, uh, the scrapping team arrive is, uh, is of, nothing, uh, of no value to us at all. After these monster jaws have had their fill, the leftovers will go to scrap metal companies to be melted down and transformed into other manufacturing goods. And it's odds on that some of the high tensile aluminium may even end up being used in the fuselage of a brand new aircraft. At Chicken's end of the plane reclamation business, subtlety doesn't need to be a factor, but time certainly is. It's almost a production line at the moment. The way they're tearing them down pretty fast, they come onto the yard, so the faster we get these cut and smashed up, the better for everyone.
The whole reclamation process is a system where each section relies on the one before or after to hit their deadline. If Chicken and the demolition boys don't clear their yard in time, then there's nowhere to put the next plane and the whole system grinds to a halt. All the bits that have been removed uh, by, by them through, uh, through the wagons will be uh, smelted down, sorted out, and uh, hopefully as much will be uh, recycled as possible and be given a, a new lease of life. It's another job well done for the lads from EQ.